Well, everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Michael Lynch, and this talk is called Why Good Developers Write Bad Tests. So there are a few ideas in programming that we generally agree are best practices. But, and the, these practices do make the code better, but we forget sometimes that these were developed for production code. And throughout this talk, I want to show you that test code is different. And if we want to write effective tests, we need to reevaluate the techniques that we use when we write the test code. So throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about techniques that apply to testing in general. But just to keep things concrete, I'm going to focus on unit tests. So unit tests are tests at the smallest level of granularity. So it's when you're verifying that a particular function is correct. So here we've got a test for the, a function called Fahrenheit to Celsius. And we're, we're passing in 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're verifying that it uh, converts to 100 degrees Celsius. And so if you were modifying that Fahrenheit to Celsius function, you would run these unit tests to make sure that you haven't broken behavior. Because if you ever run this function and you don't get 100 degrees Celsius, you know that you've either broken your code or something radical has happened in standards and measurements. So this is a, a common pattern of unit tests that I see. So we've got this, this test for a function called getScore. We've got this account manager instance, and we're calling the getScore method. And so we're calling getScore for Joe123, and uh, Joe's123 score is 150. And so if you read this test, the, the thing that should jump out to you is, where did Joe123 come from? And then similarly, why is Joe123's score 150? And so generally, if you, if you see a test like this, the developer will say, oh, well, the answer is in the setup method. And so in Python, the setup method is a test fixture. The unit test framework calls the setup method before executing each test function. So it, it sets up common state. And so the, the developer who wrote this might say, OK, see, we, we create this mock database. And Joe123 is there with a score of 150. And so everything you need is right there. But this is actually a, a bad test. And throughout the, the rest of the presentation, I want to explain why I think that and what you can do to avoid some of these issues. So test code is not like other code. Um, I mentioned that earlier. So when we think about production code, there, there's no production code that is small enough to, to fit in just 10 lines of code, except for like a trivial hello world. For most production applications, it's thousands to often millions of lines of code. And that's so much logic that we developers can't fit all of that into our, our head at once. We, we've developed all these mechanisms in language, like functions and classes and polymorphism and inheritance. And all these things were meant to um, manage that complexity and abstract it into layers so we can think about it in digestible chunks. So when we think about good production code, we think about code that is well factored. So it, it allows us to think in these little digestible chunks. So test code is different in, in that it's, it often is simple enough to read all at once. I mentioned that you, you wouldn't find a production application that's only 10 lines of code. But if you think about unit tests as little mini applications, they often are that simple. You, they, they start up, they call generally just one function, and then they exit. And so when you think about that, you can think about the fact that we actually can get it into just one function, where the reader can read that top to bottom. We, we don't need as many of these mechanisms that we have in uh, production code with, with uh, helper classes and helper functions if we can just have like a, a straight line, like top to bottom reading. The other is that developers often read uh, unit test functions in isolation. If you read a method in a production class, often you can't get away with just reading that method. You have to, the, the method calls other functions. It, it, uh, interacts with member variables. So you, you generally have to read that member function, maybe a little bit of code surrounding it to really understand what's going on. If you've got a unit test function, if there's 50 different unit test functions in this one test suite, the, the developer reading that doesn't want to read all 50. They should be able to get away with just reading that one. If a test fails, they want to read just that function and figure out how to fix the failing test. And lastly, Tests must be correct by inspection. Part of the reason that we have confidence in our production code is that we have tests that exercise it and tell us that the behavior is correct. With test code, we have no tests for our test code. The, the thing that's keeping 
tests correct is that we can see them and reason about them easily. If we had tests for our test code, it would just be turtles all the way down. We'd be in an infinite regression. So the thing that's keeping the tests correct is our ability to simply reason about them. So when we think about good test code, it maximizes obviousness and it minimizes complexity. So that, that's just going back to the things that we talked about. Like if the, the more indirection we add and the more logic we push into our tests, it makes it harder for the reader to, to just reason about it and verify the correctness by inspection. And so we see this a lot in the physical world. Tests are a diagnostic tool. If we look at the, the diagnostic tools and the measurement tools we use in the physical world, we see similarities of what makes good diagnostic and testing tools. So there's a weather vane. Uh, the, the tool in the center, if you've done electronic hobby uh, experimentation, is a multimeter. And then there's a compass. And the thing that these all have in common is that they're, they're very simple. When they're giving an incorrect reading, it's very obvious. It's, it's very difficult for them to break without you noticing. So like a weather vane, if it's pointing north, it's very hard for that to happen if the wind is blowing east. You would notice that the weather vane is either stuck or drastically bent. Um, same thing with a compass. Like it's, it's a very simple tool. A multimeter is a little bit more complicated, but when you compare it to the thing it's meant to test, electric circuits, it's much simpler. It just has these two probes and it gives you a single value or it, it makes a beep if there's a connection. And so that's very important when we think about our diagnostic tools. When we're testing something that's complex and we're trying to identify problems, we, we wanna think the least amount about the problem being in the tool itself. And the, the simpler that our diagnostic tools are, the less of a possibility that is, the less we have to worry about that, that uh, outcome. So one thing that's useful to think about when you're writing your tests is think about the next developer who has to come along and see this test fail. If, if they see a test failure, will they understand why it failed and what they need to do to fix it? So coming back to this uh, unit test I showed earlier where we're calling get score for account manager, if, if this fails and the, the number that comes back is 165, does another developer understand from reading this test function why that's failing? No, because all they see is 150. They don't have enough information about why it's failing. And there's a pretty simple fix for this. We can just inline the, the code that was in the setup method. And so this way, the, the reader can read that one function and have everything they need, they need to know in order to understand why this test is failing. And so that, that's a really good goal to keep in mind as you write. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing to, to note about this is that Doing this creates this arrange act assert structure. So the, the top part is, a, so if you're familiar with this, this pattern, it's a common pattern for unit testing. Arrange is where you set up your preconditions. Act is where you act on the object under test. In this case, it's account manager. And assert is where you verify that your expectations were met. And so for another developer who's familiar with this arrange act assert pattern, it's, it's much easier for them to read this test because it, it fits a pattern that they recognize. And so the reader should understand your test without reading any other code. If they're able to just uh, from read it from top to bottom, that's a huge win. It, it really imp improves the simplicity and intelligibility of your tests. So next, I want to talk about DRY. Veronica talked about that in, in just the previous talk. Uh, DRY is don't repeat yourself. And so we talk about that a lot when we talk about eliminating redundancy from code. And so here's an example of some production methods, and you'll notice that they repeat almost all of their code. Like all of the, the code between these two functions is copy pasted, except for just this one segment of a string. And so all the, the code is doing is interacting with a SQLite database. And so if this were production code, I think a lot of people in this room would say, you know, we should refactor this, we should avoid the redundancy. And we can do this. We can abstract away the difference so that the two functions differ only by the segment of the string that actually makes them unique. And a lot of people in this room would probably look at this and say, that's a good refactoring, because it's, it's fewer lines of code, it's simpler, and easier to maintain. So the problem is when we apply this same methodology to our test code. So coming back to this unit test I showed earlier, so maybe you're like, OK, that's fine. We can inline the setup method in just that one unit test. But what happens if we've got another unit test for this, this same class. So now we've got a test for adjust score. And so the setup for both of these is the same. And so you might look at this and say, OK, I, I know that DRY rule from production code. I'm going to refactor this, eliminate the redundancy, and put it into a setup method. 
But then we, we back in the same situation we were before, where now the developer who comes along later can't understand why this test is correct unless they jump around your unit test file and find the setup method. And so in this case, it's, it's important to remember that eliminating redundancy is not an end in itself. We eliminate redundancy in production code because we want to improve maintainability. In test code, maintainability is still important, but simplicity is even more important in unit testing than it is in production code. And generally, you can, you can stand a little bit more of copy-pasting in your test code, because if you're just copy-pasting in one file, it's very easy to make all those changes when the time comes. So you're, I'm not saying that you, you can never refactor out in, uh, in test code, but consider that the, the trade-offs are a little different than you're used to in production code. So when you're writing test code, remember that you should accept redundancy if it supports simplicity, because simplicity is much more important in production code. So maybe, maybe you're on board for, OK, you can, you can copy-paste three statements, six lines of code. That's not such a big deal. But what about when you, you, your setup is a huge amount of your unit test? So in this case, this, this whole block of code is just all setting up the account manager. And so this is, this is a big problem, because when there's this much setup code, it makes it hard for the reader to understand even what it is, when the test code begins. Like, what are you even testing? They have to spend a lot of time understanding this function just to understand what it is you're trying to test and what the separation is between the setup and the, the assertions. So in this case, you might be tempted to write a helper method just because you can't have, I think this is like 15 lines of code. Nobody wants to copy paste 15 lines of code in all their tests. And so the thing to keep in mind in this case is, well, why is this, this code so hard to test? And if we take a closer look at this account manager class, um, we can see. So the first parameter is this, uh, this user database. And so that makes sense. It's, it's an account manager. It needs a data store. And then the next parameter is this privilege manager. And there's the first code smell, because it's a wrapper around a database. The first parameter was a database. So we're, we're operating on two different layers of abstraction. And then the last parameter is this URL downloader instance. And so that's very logically distant from the other two parameters. And so in this case, it seems that the real problem is in the production code. So if if your production code is hard to instantiate and work with in test code, it's likely going to be difficult to work with in production code as well. So if your first instinct is to add a helper method to make it easier to instantiate, see if you can refactor your production code to make it easier to work with. Because if, if you make the production code easier to work with, it's going to improve it in test code, and it's going to improve it in production code as well. So improving your production code simplifies your test code. So sometimes you, you just don't have an option. Maybe another team owns that, that class, owns that interface, or maybe you, that, that class is used in 2,000 places, and you've got to push a release tomorrow, so you just don't have time to make all those changes. And you, just, you need a helper method to make it easier to write your tests. So when you do really need a helper method, you have to remember to avoid the cardinal sin of test helper methods, which is to avoid burying critical values in your unit test. So when I say critical value is it's any value that the reader needs to know in order to understand the correctness of your test. So I'll give you an example. So we've got this account manager object again. And in this case, we've got this helper method. And we, we have this familiar problem where we don't know where Joe 123 came from, and we don't know why the score is 150. And the answer here is because it's in this helper method. And the helper method has these two critical values buried inside of it. And so in this case, we're, we're obscuring the reader's understanding. We're forcing them, again, to jump around our test file to understand what's going on. There's also a, a different sin here in that we're calling account manager dot add account. And this, this also makes it harder for the reader to understand the test, because ideally you want all of your interactions with the object under test. In this case, it's this account manager object. You want all the interactions with that object in the test itself. You want the reader to be able to read your test function and say, OK, like you, you added the account here. You're increasing the score here. And then here is the result. It's much harder for them to follow it if they have to, to jump and follow all of its behavior through different helper functions. And so we can, we can avoid this. We can use helper methods when we need them, but just ensure that the critical values stay at the call site. And so here's an example of a rewrite where we're 
we're getting rid of some uninteresting code in a helper method, but we're keeping all of the critical values in the test itself. So we can see Joe 123, we can see 150, and so it's very easy for the reader to trace that progression, 150, 25, 175. Like if, if your reader can do addition, they understand what the test is doing. And so there, there is still a helper method, and it's getting rid of some boilerplate, but you, I didn't really even have to show that to you. There's nothing really interesting there in the helper method. You could have guessed what's there, and there's some values there, but they're not relevant to the test. So remember, don't bury your critical information in your test helper methods. So next I want to talk about naming. So if you had the option between these two function names, which would you choose? First is user exists and their account is active, in good standing with all bills paid, or the other option is, is account active? So I think a lot of the people in this room would probably choose is account active because it's it's not as rich as the first, the first name, but it, it's concise, it conveys about the same amount of information in a, a lot less words. If this were a Java conference, I think everybody would be saying, well, there was a, they're both too short. <laughs> but, <laughs> this is a Python conference, so we, we value conciseness. So this is actually not the case in test code because there's a key difference in tests. You, you only write calls to test, you, you actually never have to write calls to test functions. You write the name of a test function exactly once when you write the function signature. And so one of the problems with writing a, an incredibly long name in production code is that you're forcing your teammates, every, every time anyone wants to call that function after, they're, they're typing out this 72 character name. In, in a test function, you're not ever forcing anybody to type it out. You're not messing with line lengths because the, the unit test framework itself is what calls the, the test method. So you don't have to worry as much about being very verbose with your test names. It still matters. You can't have like 200 character test names because uh, that, that kind of screws things up. But you can, you can weight it a lot less than you did in production code. So here's an example. Imagine you're, you're working with this class called tokenizer. And it takes a, a data stream and it has this uh, next token method. And so imagine you you made some changes to it, and you ran your unit test, and you see a failure in test next token. And that's a very common pattern I see with developers when they're writing unit tests. They'll just take the name of the function they're calling in the unit test, and they'll prefix that function with test, and that's the name of their unit test. So the problem here is if you saw that failure, you wouldn't really know what you did wrong. The, the error is empty string is not none, but you, you don't know what that means. So compare this with if the, the unit test that failed was called, test next token returns none when stream is empty. And so in that case, it's giving you a lot of information. You, you probably don't have to go read the test implementation to understand that the tokenizer expects that when the input object, the stream, is just an empty data stream, next token should return none, and instead it's returning the empty string. So that's really powerful. If you, can, if you can give readers enough information just with the test name, they don't have to go and read the implementation of your test, that's a huge win for you, and it's a, it's a huge improvement in the efficiency of your unit tests. So name your tests so well that others can diagnose failures from the name alone. So lastly, I wanna talk about magic numbers. So a magic number, is a numeric value or string that appears in code without an explanation of why it's there. So here's an example. We've got this calculate pay function, and it's taking uh, 80 as a parameter. And so to a reader, we don't really know where this 80 is coming from. And as a developer community, that's why we hate magic numbers, which is this mysterious value in the code that we don't understand. And so as a community, we've sort of decided we we want to get rid of magic numbers, and we've replaced them with named constants. So in this case, we've got hours per week is 40, weeks per pay period is two, and so that explains where the 80 is coming from. Now, there's an explanation for, for all the values. So that makes a lot of sense in production code. So if you're somebody who, who really hates magic numbers, this unit test looks correct to you because it's replaced all magic numbers with named constants. And so it's a unit test for this greeter class. It, it takes the user's name and a custom greeting and it puts them together to greet the user with their name. And so in this case, we're, we're taking the greeting, we're, we're constructing the expected message and making sure that the, the class does the right thing. So let's get a little bit crazy and imagine that we're gonna use magic numbers. So let's, let's look at what this, 
test looks like with magic numbers or magic strings. So it's a lot simpler. It's, it's three lines of code as opposed to six, and it's just extremely clear. You can see what all the parameters are, and you can see how they fit together. You don't have to do this, this mental string concatenation to understand what the expected value is. And so coming back to the, the original, how many people spotted the bug? So I, I see two hands, three. So the bug is on this line. So we're, we're just doing a concatenation of the two strings, but if you really did that, there's a missing space. And so this is the kind of thing I see very often in unit tests. And so if, if there's some kind of complex arithmetic operation or just some kind of concatenation, sometimes developers will just take whatever logic was in the production code and copy paste it into the test code because they're, they're used to working with these named constants. So the problem is that the more logic you add to your test code, the easier it is for subtle bugs to slip by. And so it was, it was very easy for this bug to slip by if we had just done this with the, the the direct strings, it would have been very obvious. It, it stands out when there's no space between the two words. So the, the other reason to, the other thing to keep in mind is the reason that we don't like magic numbers in production code, a lot of them don't actually apply in test code. So in production code, it creates this implicit coupling. So if you see 80 in one part of the code and then you see 80 in another file, you don't know if they're the same 80 or if they just happen to, to be the same thing. Um, and so using named constants creates this explicit dependency. If, there's, if the two 80s depend on each other, then they use the same constant. That can't really happen in test code, because if, you, if you've used a magic number in a unit test function, there can't be any other code that takes a dependency on that number. So you don't have to worry about that as much. The other issue is that the reader has to wonder why it's chosen. If we see an 80, there's, there should be a reason in production code why it's 80 and not 79. In unit tests, it's often is just an arbitrary number. If, if we've passed in Joe 123 instead of Mary 456, there's not really a good reason why we chose one over, over the other. It just had to be a string that kind of looks like a username. And so you can use things like the, the test function name to give hints about, like maybe you want to test with a positive number, maybe you have to test with a number that's between a certain range, but you don't have to, you're not forced as much as in production code to explain the reasoning for your choice in the name of the constant. Yeah, so the, the name should explain the, the choice of inputs. So prefer magic numbers to named constants in test code. So to summarize, keep the reader in your test function, accept redundancy if it supports simplicity, refactor production code before adding test helpers, don't bury in critical inf information in test helpers, go crazy with long test names, and embrace magic numbers, they are your friends. And so uh, this, this talk was originally a blog post, and if you wanna find it online, you can uh, go to my blog, or you can just Google good developers bad tests. Um, if you wanna email that to all your friends and say it's the best blog post you've ever written, that's totally fine, I don't mind. Uh, I'm on Twitter, at Deliberate Coder, and there's my email. And if you wanna read these slides, they're on mtlynch.page.link slash gdbt-pg, good developer bad test, Pi Gotham. And lastly, um, if you have any services that you wish existed. So there's a scene, I don't know if anybody recognizes this from Bad Boys 2, there's the bad guy in that movie is a drug kingpin, and at one point he has to totally pause his drug empire because he finds out that rats are in his vault eating his money, and he has to figure out how to, how to stop that problem. And he says to his right-hand man, Carlos, this is an effing stupid problem to have. And I think a lot of people in their jobs experience that, where there's some problem that's totally unrelated to your mission that you're like, why am I doing this? I just want to pay somebody $5,000 a month to run a managed service, so I never have to think about it again. Um, so I'm interested in building that managed service and taking your $5,000 a month. So uh, if, if you've got a problem like that, come talk to me uh, or shoot me an email. So do we have time for questions? Yeah, so we have time for a few questions. So uh, if you want to shout it out, I'll repeat it into the mic. Yes. If there was a comment there, it would help to explain the purpose of adding in that string. And then the second part of the question, if it was a function test to call a function block, you call that function, then there's a block code with comments behind it, why wouldn't you go ahead and add comments in there? 
Uh, so to answer the, the first question, um, so the, the question was noticing that in, in my named constants, I didn't uh, add functions to explain the reasoning behind those named constants. And that's true in, in oh, maybe I've misunderstood the question. Why would you rather explain the words instead of just using, uh, why would you rather use that instead of adding commas to explain? Oh, oh, why would we use named constants in, instead of comments to explain a magic number? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, why is the conventional wisdom to replace magic numbers with named constants instead of just adding um, code comments to explain why the number was chosen? So um, part of the reason is to ensure that the consistency between different parts of the code. If one part of the code relies on a constant and uh, another file uh, has, has a dependency, like has to be consistent with that number, it's easier if the, both of them are just using a named constant. That way you can just update the value in one place without trying to find every instance where you've used that value and wondering whether uh, it, it has to be that they're all matching. Because if, if you just did it with code comments, there's not a way for, um, to, to enforce that dependency in code. And so I think there was a second part, can we, I, I missed the second part of the question. Do we want to go back to that? The second part is, for example, using that number 80 that you showed. You had a preference in magic numbers using the word constant, and then 40, or then you had two others after that. You could have comments uh, interjected in between for like hours or something like that. Is that, a, is that because of redundancy, or is that because it's just simpler to use a code comment? Uh, it's it's simpler, and it, you you achieve this um, enforcement of consistency across other parts. Anything else that needs to use the same value. Uh, sorry, the question is like, uh, why why aren't we just using comments in the instance where I showed uh, hours per week is forty and uh, weeks per period is two? Yeah, correct. All right, all right. Thank you for the question. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Thank you. Yes. Pi test fixtures, uh, I, so I, I'm kind of against them. Uh, I, I'm, so the question is, how do I feel about pi test fixtures? And so it's, it's sort of how I feel about fixtures in general. Um, I think they have their place if you really need a test fixture, if, if um, your code is, it, it becomes really hard to write your test because you don't have fixtures. But I think they should be like your third or fourth option behind refactoring your production code to make it easier to interact with so that you don't need so much boilerplate and writing your tests so that they, uh, you can just read them from top to bottom without having to understand these text fixtures. Because I think one of the problems with test fixtures is that um, it, it eliminates your ability to just read a, f a function in isolation and understand what it does. And that's really important in tests. Um, so I think that's all the time we have, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions outside during the break. Uh, thank you very much, everybody.